The following is a fictitious episode in the lives of two make-believe hobos. The characters and events you hear are not real. Don't freak out. Hello buddies, it's the Box Guy Buddies back again with another show. We are taking a nice dippy in this nice swimming pool. Take a little splash and have a laugh as Greg and Donnie float around. Talking about movies, it's so groovy that we love this ice cold pooly that we want to dip our feeties in. I want to eat this shrimp and crackers with dunk it in that chlorine. Tastes so good and make me scream. My favorite color is green. And Don is really mean. He smells like piss. He's a piss motherfucker. He's Bear Grylls reborn. He is a fart knocker. You suck. Why? <laughs> just because I just because I ate the, the last shrimp. I told you that dirty vein. That dirty vein always entices me. You're disgusting. I so wanted it. I brought EpiPens just so I could eat shrimp today, and you. Had what? I'm sorry, I, I can't help myself. We can't really shrimp. go back to fucking room service. We've been in this pool for like eight hours. I know. Oh, this is so great. I it's mean, a good it's... thing it's January. Yeah. Who no, the it's... fuck vacations in January? It's like the worst month of the year. It is the worst. It's it, the worst one. It's the start. It's cold. Everyone's upset I'm all over. the time. Yeah, you're and, we're, like and the all the good shit doesn't happen until like spring. Yep. Yeah. Or like late February. You're staring down the barrel of just low vitamin D, gray skies, cold temperatures. This is obviously Midwest that we're talking about specifically here. I'm sure other places... Yeah, unless you're in Earth. California where it's, ooh, a whopping 60 degrees outside. Ooh, everything is so lovely here <laughs> on the West Coast. Which is... How Californians uh, talk. Oh, sure. dearie. I forgot to bring a, a nice butter knife to cut into my avocado with. How on earth am I supposed to butter my scone? You know, my mother gave me her Martha's Vineyard. That's my mother's name, Martha. Yes, I did know this. She also gave you her colitis. She also gave me her kaleidoscope. Indeed. It's on your back, sir. Yes. That way I can always grab it and take a look into the sky and see mm. what valuable colors come out of it. Perfection. Rich colors that none of the poorer folk have any mindset into. <laughs> Did you know that there are actually 50 different colors? No. But we block out the rest of them for the poor. Mm, yes, quite. That's the way. <laughs> Delicious. And that's why Greg and I kind of hang out <coughs> in the Midwest. We try to avoid the coasts. It's, uh, it's people like this. It's the perfect middle ground of still snarky but not full asshole like the East Coast. Yes. And uh, we have s smart tastes, but we're not, you know, fucking... We don't throw it in your face, and yeah. we don't think we're better than you because of it. We're just exposed to good stuff, Chicago. Well, that's not true. I am better. Yeah, Greg. Greg yeah, Greg is better. I'm also slightly better. Don's better lie. than most of you guys. Yeah, I, I'm slightly, but yeah, assholes on the East Coast, right? Like, is that not? It's such a stereotype, but it's just like. You but know, it's it's true. What a hey, fuck you. I'm walking here. Hey, what's the weather over there? You fuck you. What oh, do you know? Oh, it's cold. Hey, how's the weather up there, tall guy? Ha <laughs> ha, you haven't heard that 30 times. You're I'm just busting your balls. Yeah, real piece of shit. I'm really just you? busting your balls, man. Just because I love you. Really grabbing your balls. Yeah, I love you. I'm, I'm just giving your balls a nice little kneading. A squeeze. I'm just giving them a nice little yank. Giving your balls a kiss. <laughs> That's the East Coast, comparatively. So that's why we stay here in the middle. And it's just, you know, we got some nice... It makes me think of the... Indecisive. Th yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's... As is the weather. That's what happens. All throughout the year, it is indecisive. Just flowing around all through the cycle of what's possible in terms of weather. Like now, it's... Uh, 
you know, it's it's palatable in the middle of January, and that's why there's still water in the pool. And Greg and I are just floating in this bitch. I can't really agree or disagree on that. Why? Because I'm a little indecisive. Yes. Yeah, you are. And that's why you know, you're bringing it a whole circle. Uh huh. Bringing this wavy circle. You yes. Know, this kind of circle. But it's okay because you're drawing it in the water, and it just you know the waves just make it disappear. You can always start again. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Ooh, ripples. Look at those ripples. Like everyone who listens to every new episode of the Boxcar Buddies. Hi, friendos. Hi. We're the Boxcar Buddies. I'm Don. I'm Greg. And uh, Greg and I are, if this is your first time joining us, um, welcome. And if you're a recurring visitor, we appreciate you as welcome always. Welcome back. Yeah. And what, but if it is your first time, Greg and I are... We're located, as we just alluded to, we're located in Chicago, and neither of us have uh, permanent homes or residences of any kind. We are in the wind. We're kind of like Ronin. Ronin. Yeah. That's a, that's a fancy term for hobo. Oh, I but thought it's it got was like, like... But it's got... They have, like, swords, because they're, like, samurai. I was thinking, like, you know, you said Ronin. I thought it was Conan the Barbarian, except, like, a poor no, man's we're, version. No, we're Conan the... Late night host. Ah, so that's why our heads are so huge. And our bodies are so lanky. <laughs> that, man, man. that man is made out of spaghetti. He is. He's the true rubber band man. Yeah. I think truly, I think we could throw, if we were to throw things at him, if we ever got into his show, I'm positive they would bounce right off. And he would just have a quizzical look on his face. Like, does, what just happened? Does that mean his uh, little co-host there is his meatball, if he's the spaghetti? Certainly. Uh. Yes. Is, is his, isn't his name Chewy? Is that his name? Yeah, Chewy. Yeah. Chewy, the meatball man. Indeed. Co-host uh, of Conan, Late Nights late on night. TBS. I just haven't, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm a late Nights on T- TSB. TSB. Yes, the most important television network in the uh, Boxcar Buddy lore. Yeah, the true sentence builder. Yeah. It's, well, it's what it was originally called. Now I'm sure some marketing guys got into it and it's, it's all tweaked out, but that is definitely... It's probably got a, a ton of other anagrams associated with it. Mm-hmm. It's fine, whatever. Yeah, we're, we, we're not affiliated anyway. We just like no. it. We just like it. But we are affiliated with uh, finding things and watching them and telling you if you should watch them or not. Yes, that is what we do. That's why we meet. In addition to trying to find food, shelter, warmth... Hotels uh, with unattended pools uh, during winter season, anything to bring us together and uh, where we can help each other because that's another part of life that's nice is getting to people, getting with people that you care about and kind of helping each other along through the, the drudges and everybody feels drudges. It's kind of what, what January feels like a lot of the time. It just, it's, it's sort of a, a much sharper edge. Lunch. Yeah, to those drudges. It's the sharper edge. Yes. The sharpest mm-hmm. of the year, I think, yeah. really slices uh, through the dermis there. But yeah, um, it's the air purifier of months right now. Oh yeah, wow. yeah, just cuts cuts right through any of the fun times. That's what January does, and this is when you need, you know, friends, family, people you care about, and good content, good stories. And that's the other thing Greg and I love to seek out in all of their forms: music, movies, TV shows, video games, things that are streaming Books. on all your favorites. Sometimes just looking at a movie poster. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it involves a uh, YouTube or Twitch or something that we've just been catching along. Absolutely, the internet, a glorious provider of content all the time now and uh and that's what uh you know and that's what one of the things that we'll talk about when we're trying to distract ourselves from the uh the crappier parts of of the day to day and uh what i'll say is greg this past week i caught a movie that is out in theaters whoa yeah I wow happened, i happened into a theater i was alone i was just wandering the streets looking mm-hmm, for food mm-hmm. this was one of those days we went our separate ways and um i wandered into a theater on the south side. I can't say as I recall what it was. AMC was the was the brand, but I don't know which building it was on or, or the streets. I was, you know, this was day two of unintentional fasting, let's say, and uh, I was a little delirious from mm-hmm. hunger. So I kind of wandered in there. Um, there is there's an exit which doesn't close all the way, and I noticed it as I was walking by. It just kind of had that wedged 
outward look of a door that's not quite closed. Like the door jam just got stuck in the crack just a little bit so yes. that it looked like it was closed, but mm-hmm. it was most definitely open. Yeah, and when you can see it, when you look along, like parallel to the door, when you're looking at it from the side, you can see that shove out. And so I just kind of grabbed it, walked inside, did the classic, grab a little bucket out of the, out of the trash bin, tear it in the corner, take it to the counter and say, hey, this, you know, my bucket ripped, please refill me and give mm-hmm. me a new bucket. And then they give it to you and they fill it up with popcorn. Do you want butter on this? Fuck yes, I want butter on that. It's winter. And Can I'm you just starving. put butter in my mouth, please? Yeah. How about you just walk away? How about you walk away and take your break right now and leave me back here for five minutes so I can just put my head under the butter dispenser and leave that thing on full blast? Also, if you have the nacho cheese dispenser, can we just kind of like combine the both of them? Now you're talking. Now you use the butter to wash down that gooey cheese. It, from the same dispenser, instead of having to move your head quickly back and forth in order to catch like a mouthful yeah, it's, of each. It's like a, it's like a slurpy like, combo swirl. Yeah, if it would twist it, you know, yeah. like just twist it into your bucket. And it's like a chocolate have... vanilla swirl, but butter and cheese. Jeez. Where are you on this, Wisconsin? Why don't Wisconsin Where are you on this, this America? I, I'm really, this is just... We... we I have found so many different ways of making like solidified butter and all these different kinds of like fucked up super fatty snacks. Why do we not have a cheese butter combo? Absolutely. Also, who, why hasn't someone created a turducken as an actual animal in a lab? Everybody talks about it. They make sandwiches at different restaurants. Turducken is a big American thing. Why hasn't someone created a chicken inside of a duck inside of a turkey? And you know they why? just live like that. Because people are scared. You think so? Cowards. They're not willing to innovate. They just want to keep things as is. You know we've got the capability to do this. You know we've got, like, the ability. Do we? I think. I'd like to think so. I hope so. Yeah. But in any case, what is this movie thingy that you watched? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I was was at the theater, and I walked in, and they had a couple different options. I walked into Theater One, and they happened to be showing a little movie starring Christian Bale called... Fat. No... (laughs) Fat? Fat. It, fat. It should have been fat. It should have just been called fat. It was about Dick Cheney. Uh, if anyone not familiar, he was a vice president during the George Bush administration in America. He was, he was an American vice president. And this particularly was about, it was about his whole life, how he got to where he was at that point. And, and Cheney was played by Christian Bale. And... That boy put on some serious poundage for he, that movie. He certainly did. As, I've only seen the trailer, but who boy, as Chris, he got juicy. As Christian Bale is wont to do, he threw himself into a role. He's a method actor. And, and he it, threw himself into a bag of Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> threw himself into Probably a, some Hawaiian sweet rolls. By the way, let's just say, a guy like Christian Bale... Who, Probably some egg rolls. A guy like Christian Bale who got down to 119 pounds to play the role in The Machinist... Versus gaining fifty or sixty pounds of fat to play he's, Dick Cheney, which do you think he, is he prefers? Easily like two two thirty in that movie. Which do you think he prefers to do? Uh, Gain the weight, right? No, you know what? He strikes me as he strikes me as one who <laughs> a fucked up guy. I, re- I really like to get really thin there. He said he he said he drank only. That was a my best my best Welsh accent. I, I heard think that. I nailed it. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, because when Welsh. when you're Welsh, you you have to add age to it. Is it was Welsh done? So that was shut the fuck up. So Christian Bale. So, but anyway, he said all he did was drank a cup of coffee and ate one apple a day when he was losing the weight to one nineteen. That that's just it. To get up to two thirty from like whatever his natural weight is one seventy, like maybe one eighty or something. Because he's a muscly boy, I'm gonna say he's around one ninety. Something something like that. So you put on what thirty forty pounds. How, how do you, to do, to for specifically, not bulking up like like muscle, you just got to go and like shovel a cheeseburger in there. You know, you got to eat like, you know, th- four or five meals a day. Josh oh, Brolin did the same thing for uh, that old boy remake. He he ate like, oh. he, he had to try and gain and lose like 30 pounds in the span of like four weeks. Oh, good Lord. And I was like, you should do all the scenes of chubby Josh Brolin first. Yeah. But he didn't even really look super chubby. Like he, he... He had a little bit of a dad bod, but it's still Josh still, Brolin, still, so he's a still little jacked. He's still made of like fucking concrete. Yeah, yeah. The man, the man is a wood figurine for sure. Also, the old boy remake is garbage. Watch the original. Yeah, watch the original. I think old boy is on Netflix, if I'm not mistaken. But if it's not, if you it's can the find Josh Brolin one, don't watch it. No. It's a big old fucking waste of time. Anyway, 
Back to Fact. Vice. Back to it's Vice. It's That's Fact. what I forgot to say. The movie is called Vice. It's about the Vice President Dick Cheney. And Christian Bale plays him, gained a lot of weight for it. So my impressions of the movie are, look, what Greg and I like to do here is we like to recommend stuff that's, you know, a little bit, you know, something that you can escape into. And this movie, like, it does provide you with a whole life story of not just Dick Cheney, but his wife, Lynn Cheney, who was played by Amy Adams. She does a great job. And, and he, Sam Rockwell is Bush, isn't he? Yeah, Sam Rockwell is Bush. <laughs> Steve Carell is Donald Rumsfeld. Wow. Tyler Perry was Colin Powell. He was only in like three or four who, scenes. Who played, uh, who played Huckabee? Was it, was it Steven Tyler? I don't recall, actually. I don't recall who played Huckabee. It was, uh, but but there. In any case, the point is, is that all these characters in this particular drama were real people. All the acting they were based off of real people who were in power at this particular chapter in American history. And the movie was written and directed by Adam McKay, produced by Will Ferrell, actually. So, among others. But the point is, comedian is that comedian Will Ferrell, comedian Will Ferrell. Dang. But he wasn't wasn't in the movie in any in any way. Good. At least that I didn't see. You don't you have know. Will Ferrell in there, just screaming non sequiturs for. <laughs> Let's go to war with Iraq! God damn it! Yeah, no, it wasn't. Wow, that's, that would have been an amazing movie. <laughs> but wow. No, they, they didn't do that. They didn't put you through that. But, but any- well, actually, he would probably play Bush if he was going to be in it. I guess if he was going to... If there was, a, if there was anything... If there was a role that he was going to do that he would probably do an okay job with, it would be Bush. But if I'm given the choice between fucking Will Ferrell doing... Bush or Sam Bush Rockwell. just doing his SNL bits. Right. Or Sam Rockwell, who is just genuinely fun to look at. Sam Rockwell, by the way, again, another guy who disappears into roles. He did a fine job as Bush. You know it's Sam Rockwell, but at the same time... Because he does all the Sam Rockwell, like, look around. He's like... Well, but Whoa. he's but he, he gives to be that fair, dumb guy he, stare. He sound he did a great job with the voice. He mm. sounded a lot like George W. Like, it's just Texas, full on. Like, it, it reminded me of, like, his voice, for sure. But the real gem of the whole movie, the reason to see it, is it's Christian Bale. It reminded me of when Gary Oldman last year for uh, his portrayal of Winston Churchill. When he put on all that weight and became like the balding old white dude and portrayed him that way, Christian Bale did it. Same thing with Dick Cheney, but you know, whereas Gary Oldman is English and Winston Churchill was English, Dick Cheney's American and Christian Bale's you know, English or Welsh, I guess. He's Welsh. So you... Um, he, uh, Christian Bale's vocal work is always uh, excellent. Yeah. Like he always does a great job, and just his it, it, the the real the real like purpose of seeing the movie is to watch him portray this guy. But he Christian Bale has said that Satan was his inspiration for playing the character of Cheney. And this movie overall, the reason I bring up like the Adam McKay writing and directing thing is that it's obviously biased. It's a biased look through the window of time into those events in American history. And a lot of people are not going to like that. I can just tell. In the movie might be enjoyable, but it's going to rub a lot of people the wrong way. You can just see Well, it's, it's taking real life events and fictionalizing it. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. in a way. They're fictional. Like, they're not going to make everything fully 100% correct because it's not a documentary. It's a movie. Exactly. It needs structure. It, it needs... It needs peaks and valleys. It needs acts. And so... It, it, it's certainly that. And you might even be inclined to over-dramatize it at certain points or take creative licensing with things to make a point that the writer and director would like to make rather than sticking to the facts and, you know, just reporting on things. Because you you have to make a movie entertaining. It's It's not a documentary. You're not there to learn. You're there to be entertained. Yes, exactly. So that being said, the movie kind of reminded me of a mixture between House of Cards... And The Big Short. The Big Short being the movie from a few years ago, also directed by Adam McKay, portraying Mm -hmm. the 2008 financial crisis. Christian Bale was in that. Steve Carell was in that. That also was a very enjoyable movie. But it reminds this vice reminds me of that because it took a sort of a lot of topics that are weighty. You know, you got The Big Short financial stuff. 
You're talking about I mean, banks shit that and happens insurance. So, like not a long time ago. It's it's only been about like 15, 16 years Abs- since all these events. So. Ab- absolutely, and, but but the point is is that it's like it's it's deep into political lingo, and like you're you're sort of you're trying to explain something over the span of a movie that is not the easiest concept to grasp in the first place, yeah. or you know a lot of people like their eyes glaze over. You know, you start talking about insurance fraud and, and finances and, and stocks, and well, who the fuck is going to watch do, a movie about Do that? they glorify Dick Cheney at all, or do they make him out to be they, like... They vilify him. Okay. It's, it's, Dick Cheney is very clearly, you know, they, they show him he's to be... He's the villain protagonist. He's the villain protagonist. And ultimately, what the main... Um, you know, I was like talking with some other people in the theater after you know, it had all done, and you know, I'm done with my popcorn. I'm trying to you know gather, some trying to get the candy rest of their and, snacks. Yeah, yeah. So in the mid before I you know pitch that, we're talking about the movie and what what they what was what became clear. One of the things is that it's like the main point of it was that they show you that Dick Cheney and his band of you know friends in that close circle of the White House that they started the Iraq war or they chose Iraq as a target specifically with the intent of bumping the stock value of Dick Cheney's company, Halliburton, bumping that up. Like the Iraq war made that stock value go up 500%. Wow, something. that sounds like information that just... Exactly. So, but, but, so, but it's interesting. Right over that, my head. Over the head. Adam McKay does a very... He... he, he has a style, he did it with the big short, with text on the screen, and cutaway scenes where all of a sudden the fourth wall's being broken because you step out of the main plot of the, of the story, and you've got characters talking directly to the audience, trying to explain something in the midst of like a little breakaway from the story. And some similar things happen in Vice as well, where it's like you break away from the main storyline, and you have these characters explaining something to the audience directly with different examples. Samuel Jackson and comes in and gives a narration. More, more along the lines of like, it's a different, like it's the same scene, but all of a sudden the guys, the, the lines change. The right. exposition and the, and the fiction of it, you're, you, you just know that it, you're stepping into different people who are talking and the, the point of them talking is to illustrate and clarify something that was just referenced so that you can continue forward. Interesting. Would and, you recommend it? Um, I do because I love Christian Bale and because I thought it was an enlightening movie because I, I did know a lot of, I, I knew a lot of the players in this game. I have heard reference to them even after the facts in news, in other, you know, various like things. And, and some of these guys got like imprisoned later and just like, it was fascinating to me to kind of put these pieces into place as to who these real life figures were. But I personally, as I said, it, it reminded me of House of Cards meeting the Big Short. I like both of those contents. Like yeah. I like both of them, and so I enjoyed the uh, uh, Vice and Christian Bale. There's, there were scenes that made me laugh out loud, and it's just Christian Bale's a joy to watch. He's got this monologue at the end where he just turns to the camera, and I mean it's. You know, it's it definitely made me feel things throughout the movie. Again, Amy Adams did a great job too. It's just it was it was enjoyable, but it's not for everybody. I know that. So just know what it's about going into it, and know that you know it's it's biased through the writer director's lens. You know, of course. But yeah, that's that's what I saw, and then uh, I did get some candies and some popcorn after the discussion in the theater. Yummy, yummy, yeah. yummy. Uh, some of them were <clears throat> mounds, though. Uh, mounds, which uh, I despise. Mounds, mounds, and almond joys. Like I'm, o- I'm okay with. I'm okay with the almond joy because it's milk chocolate. Mounds are dark chocolate. And you don't like coconut. dark chocolate? I do. I love no, dark chocolate. I do in some situations. But if it's only paired with coconut, yeah, nope. I can understand it. Co- nope, I nope. think coconut is nasty. It's really tough. Like it's really tough. Like there have been times when I've been dancing in Millennium Park for like food or snacks Couple or whatever. Bucks, people yeah. people like I I did it last year around uh February. So they're giving me like their leftover Valentines. Were you wearing like, your coconut bra? Is that yeah. what you're going to say? I, they they were throwing me their leftover like Valentines Day candies and all that's left of them are the fucking coconut ones cuz no uh, one wants to eat them. Exactly. I cannot tell you how many, you know, after Halloween, how many bags get dumped out. And exactly. What's left, what's left at the end? Coconut candy. You have to keep track on who's the family that's selling the Almond Joys and the Mounds. Don't I'm like, go, go, go fuck yourself. Don't even go over there. You guys suck. Mm-hmm. 
Well, what'd you see, man? What'd you do? Speaking of sucking, uh-huh. well, I've been hanging out with Drippy a little bit more to get the rest of this arm completed. Yeah. Yeah, so oh, now I have an elbow. I did. I'm sorry, I didn't notice that because you've got the quarter sleeves going, so I yeah. didn't see your elbow there. That is great. Isn't it? It's got a built in lighter into it, too. Too bad I've been, you know, splashing around. Yeah. But check well, this out it's got a little floaty device. <laughs> you one half now i won't drown one half of you is floating up yeah yeah the, the first thing i told drippy was hey the last couple times i've tried swimming i've almost drowned so uh Weighted down by that stuff yeah so he's been making he's been making the arm lightweight nice and he made sure to put in a little flotation device it's weird though because like this arm will like my left arm will go up and i'm like ah, ha, ha, yeah i'm floating but my right arm is still sinking me down because totally. of the hand yeah, you but, can see if you can put pop another one of those next time you're over there on the right side. Yeah, but uh, Drippy and I were doing like our usual like thing. AGDQ was going on. Awesome games done quick. Sure. It's over now. It okay. just ended uh, over the weekend. It's a good cause. We've talked about it. Yeah, I uh, got to see a couple speed runs. I really like was really looking forward to like Metal Gear Solid Two. They did Final Fantasy Nine again. Ooh, it was, uh, they did Celeste, which I was really surprised with. Uh, it was really cool, but. After we were done with that, I was like, man, I'm kind of bored. Do you have, like, any games with you at all? And he's like, eh, I've got a couple things that you can check around. Nerdy drippy. I know. Disgusting drippy. It's antisocial. Yeah. He's he's not a talker. Mm-hmm. He, he, he'll he either say, like, one word or just, like, a very quick, like, right. Rrr, rrr. Get out of here. Yeah. Sorry, always throwing you away. Yeah, away. He'll talk with his tech, though. His tech definitely Oh, he, he sends me paragraphs of what his opinions are mm-hmm. on, like, the latest like animes and i'm like all right man i know i know i like i of the two of us i'm the one that probably dabbles in the most japanese shit but like dude and he also you know what or is he one of those guys that asks you sort of an in-depth question via text yes like what's your and then he'll give you his answer before you can even answer it (laughs) like a text do you believe in god (laughs) like like that it's more like do you believe in the concept of god (laughs) Right, right. I believe as a social construct that it has been devolving the human race. I think that because of God's presence, we are actually uh, regressing into a smaller, more compact human form. It was, and the, I said, "Shut the fuck up, <laughs> right, Drippy." This, this and is finish not a con- my arm. This is not a conversation. Or I'll, we can have or text. I will bite your ears off. Yeah, you cannot be texting that with somebody. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Well, he has his computer hooked up to like this big projector under the water tower. He lives in the water tower of right, Chicago. Right. Uh, and I'm just scrolling through like his PC games, and I'm like, "Oh, you have the new Far Cry." He's like. And what what did you think of it? He's like, eh. yeah. I'm like, Meh. all right, that sounds good to me. Yeah, I'll try it. I'll try it. So I played uh, Far Cry Five. Far Cry Five, obviously from the name itself, it's the fifth game. Right. <laughs> well, I wouldn't even say it's the fifth game Six? because there's there's primal in there. There's eight. I think there's eight. There's eight. Because there's the, there's the first two Far Crys. Far Cry Three and then Blood Dragon. Oh. Far Cry Four and then Primal. Far Cry Five. Is the seventh one, and then, and there's, then there's already the, the newest one that's coming out. Yeah, it's like the apocalypse. Uh, yeah, like the apocalypse. The nuclear one. wasteland one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Far Cry Five. Uh, the premise of it is you are the new rookie uh, cop in like this uh, Montana little national town. Park kind of a thing. It's kind of a na- it's the size of it is pretty much a national park. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's the entirety of. Hope County, it's a fictionalized, like, middle-of-the-woods, rednecky sure. place. And the concept of it is that uh, this guy is a religious cult leader. Him and his three siblings have overtaken the entire county. Uh, they are nicknamed the Peggies by the locals. And they are basically fucking up everything from hallucinogenic drugs, brainwashing, uh, just... Over like they are, they are fucking with the ecosystem. Brainwashing they, rednecks. They were brainwashing rednecks. They have a giant statue dedicated to the leader. There's a big billboard sign that just says "Yes, culty." It's it's a mega cult. Yeah. And uh, the whole the whole game, uh, what you're trying to do is take back the entirety of Hope County from the cult family, and. Uh, free your three other officers that or, or four other officers that you 
went into Hope County with to try and save them. One is a uh, FBI agent, and then the other ones are members of your sheriff's department. So you have your sheriff, uh, you have the the uh, uh, the former deputy because you become the new deputy once uh, once right. these events kick in. Uh, the game doesn't start as slowly as three and four. I've the I've only played three, four, and five. I did not play a lot of four. I played like maybe like three or four hours of it, and I got really bored. I played the the most I played was four. Actually, I got like about seventy percent through that game, and yeah. it is a slow start. It's yeah. a lot of story element at the beginning. Yeah, three I really enjoyed. It's not like the world's greatest game, but I think Far Cry Three is still really fun. And the style of it is first person, right? Yeah, and it's you're... a fir- it's a first person shooter, uh, but it's Ubisoft, so it's like quote unquote open world. You can you can do whatever you want. You can kind of do things in any order you want. You're given a lot of shit to do. Like you can go hunting. You right. can help out the locals. Free. Uh, areas from the terrorist group of whatever is yeah, there because it's, it's always it's always uh, a person like it's a fish out of water uh put into like a jungle right. that seems to be the case with all of them five changed it up instead of being a fish out of water you are the rookie of your own you know county that you work in yeah and your job is to just do your job be a cop right but like a murder cop Murder cop? Yeah, because you murder everything you come into contact with. What the heck? Uh, so in this time around, like <laughs> the way that three cop? and four worked, the fir- like it was a first person shooter, but the main characters were characters. Yeah. This time around, you are a blank slate. You pick Tabula your rasa. You pick your gender, and then you can customize the way you look, and then you never speak a word. Okay. Okay, and yeah. I Everyone like, else projects onto you. Yeah, and I'm like, I don't like first-person shooter stories like that. That's why I liked Far Cry 3, because Jason was an obvious character. And I like, I really like three story, this idea of this total douchebag who gets kidnapped by fucking pirates, uh, drug lord, like, pirates. Yeah. Uh, and then he becomes a murderer, like an actual psychopath, because he had gotten into so many drugs and hallucinogens Whoa. and the fact that he's fighting all these pirates it made him fucked like the ever since three far like four and five go really hard for trying to go for like the psychedelic look to them yes but i don't think they have ever matched how good three did it dude three sounds awesome three, i gotta play three that was fantastic <laughs> you can get it dirt cheap it's yeah. been re- it's been re-released on all consoles now. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to look around man three like, i think three is the best of the far cry games it's not an amazing game and it's very obviously like a 2009 game like you play it and you're like yep this is this is early this is like ps3 xbox 360 era game Lots of radio towers to climb. Mm mm. Lots of landmarks to find. Mm mm. Yep. Uh, five kind of gets rid of that. So there's no radio towers. You are given an a ima- You're given a massive map. Like as soon as you start the game, and you find locations either by walking into them or finding maps in these locations that give. Oh. Some of the details of the area around you. So, like a Fallout style of it, kind of. Kind of discover the location. You yeah. have to. You have to physically discover it to yeah. make it. You know, and it's cool too because uh, as the game starts, like you're you're in this like you're on this tiny little island with this crazy like bunker guy who's like, hey, I've been trying to take back the land from the Peggies for a while, so you're a cop. I want to help you, officer. Let's team up and take down all these guys. Yeah. And I'm like, dope. That sounds cool. You know, fucking freedom, America. Yeah. Because it's America themed, like, everyone is a fucking idiot. Like, you, you get uh, some really cool stuff that I like. Um, but the, the way that the story works is after your, your failed attempt at uh, arresting the Colt family, you're all separated. Uh, all of the members of your team are kidnapped and are being tortured by three of the siblings. Damn. So at the start of the game, you're given free reigns into which, into which territory you want to go into. Uh, the three siblings have their own special like story things and their own characters and their own uh, sidekick characters in each of the three regions. Ah. Uh, and the way it's broken up is 
when you go into an area and you kill Peggy's and you kill like elite members or take back areas or destroy silos, stuff like that, you get more liberation points. The more liberation points you get, the farther you get into that chapter's story. Okay. And I like that you can go into any direction you want. Yeah. But I felt like after I went into the first area, it never really enticed me to go to the second and third area. Mm. Because the game starts, obviously, by getting a a broadcast from one of the brothers, like, torturing one of your friends. Right. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go save her first because that's the one that I saw first. But there there is videotapes for uh, the other two siblings, but it's never shown. Oh. Like, you can, you can walk by TVs and see them when you're in, like, the respected region of which sibling. Yeah. But there's never a time where, like, a cutscene happens and it's like, all right, here's you the video to, in, it's an to, to introduce you to this villain. It, yeah. it never happened for me. So once you make that first choice as to which region to go into and which sibling you're going to be chasing to, you're free to go to the other ones, but they don't entice you the same way. Yeah, they don't entice me the, the same way. Um, Interesting. Uh the the villains are pretty like really cut and dry. None of them are as good as Voss from mm. three. Yeah, okay. Voss from three is an incredible villain. Yeah, I've he's, heard he's, a lot all, about he's that. been heralded as like one of the greatest video game villains ever created. Yeah, and like I don't argue it. Like he's a, he's a solid villain. He's constantly around you, and he constantly fucks with you. Uh, the villains in this game do that as well, as opposed to four, where that guy like he never fucking shows until like the end of the game. Yeah, yeah. There's like little up. There's nuggets in like the beginning yeah. of the game where he's like, oh, "Let's yeah. take your mother's ass." Yeah, you get introduced to him, and then he'll come over over a radio broadcast on occasion, and that's where it, what kind of strings you along. Yeah. But in terms of yes, physical interaction with the guy, it's like three or four times in the game. Yeah, no. Each of the each of the individual villains have a lot of contact with you to progress the story of each region, but it's kind of paper thin because your character is a blank slate, so mm-hmm. it's not really adding to like the overall story. And I don't really care about them murdering like NPCs. I'm like, I'm not really amazed by that or yeah. killing or killing secondary characters from a region that are so paper thin with story that I'm just like. Cool. You right. get, you killed the you killed a guy who yeah. wants to kill you. Yeah. I feel so sad right now. Well, like you said, it's just interesting that like I mean, cutscenes are such a huge part of like, you know, especially at the beginning and end of games and the middle too. Like they're a huge part of moving a plot forward. Yeah. And so like it's just interesting to me that they would not have an opportunity or triggers for you to really get that same draw in for the other two regions. Once you make your first choice, that's the only exposition that they kind of give you in terms of a cutscene to move forward into that. Yeah. It's just, that's not... Why or, would well, you, they'll, why they'll would for, you they'll, care? Well, they'll force you into story moments after you get enough liberation points. Mm. Uh, but what I didn't like about that was that because everything gives you liberation points, when I was just fucking around and just enjoying the game without doing the story... Just doing small things would give me liberation points, and then I missed out on missions because the way that the story is supposed to be structured, it's like, hey, uh, you should do this first mission that the crazy bunker guy gives you, because then that gives you that main hub of that region, Yeah, and that's where all the story stuff happens. Because I didn't touch that area yet, and I was just kind of fucking around doing my own thing, uh, I get a radio call from like the main character of that region to be like, Oh, we saved the area. But thanks for all the side work you've been doing. (laughs) I'm like, so you didn't even get that like payoff. Yeah, I didn't get that payoff. I think I think it's a very lukewarm experience. Like it's fun. It is a fun game. I think it's worth picking up when it's dirt cheap. Mm. Uh, If it's if you see it for like fifteen twenty bucks, like yeah, it's a good time. Don't pay full price for this game because it's. It's got a fuck ton of bugs. The story is pretty meh. Mm. And I think the ending fucking sucks. Oh, man, really? The ending leads into this uh, the apocalypse thing that's coming out, like yeah. the new Far Cry game. Yeah. So they're just going to... Yeah, they're just going to use... They're going to reuse the entire map assets of this game. That's lame. For that... I mean, they did that with Primal. I know. And Blood Dragon. That's, this, but at least with Blood Dragon, that they completely rehauled the entire aesthetic of that game. Yeah. And that's why I think Far Cry 3 and Blood Dragon are like the best Far Cry games. Blood Dragon is the best Far Cry game. Yeah. Period. It, it's it's 80s like nostalgia. It's amazing. Sweet. All the cutscenes are NES styled like 
Street Fighter uh, cutscenes. That sounds great. Uh, the main character is a really gruff uh, soldier with a metallic arm, Whoa. ready to fight crime yeah. and not do drugs. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and then all the weapons are references to like '80s action movies. You get a shotgun that's a reference to Terminator. And yeah. Shit like that. That sounds really cool. Yeah. Um, I think the thing I like the most about Far Cry 5 is that you actually have sidekick characters that you rescue and they join you. So you can have you can have your pet dog who, like, scouts areas out for you. You get this badass sniper lady. You get uh, a dude that, that... You get two pilots. Like, one is in a plane and one's in a helicopter. So you get you build a troop of support characters. You build a, a troop of support characters, but they don't add anything to the story. Right. They just help you on missions and yeah. stuff. But like, like they later. they're they're like main points of the ending though. Like the final boss fight, like all the side characters that you rescued, except the animal characters, join in the final battle. But narratively, they don't do shit. Uh, and I'm like, uh. So what it sounds like to me is that, you know, you said the ending leads into the post apocalyptic game, the next Far Cry game. Yeah. This brings up the point of like what I think some games seem to be in the direction that they're going in is releasing a... It's not releasing an incomplete game and then patching it to complete it. It's releasing... Instead of it's one... It's recycled content. It's Instead of one bomb-ass game, you're releasing two so-so games. Yeah. And together, they're supposed to be like better, but... It's $120 if you pay full price for both. Well, I don't I don't think like you can you can easily play this new Far Cry game that's going to come out and know nothing of Far Cry 5. I think you would be fine. But it's the fact that the new Far Cry game is just going it's literally using the exact uh, we don't I'm only speculating at this point, but how primal was mm. just using the same exact map. Yeah. Like nothing's changed. It's just that now aesthetically it's like Ooh, it's post-apocalyptic. Ooh, there's pink. Right, right. Ooh. <laughs> Gazuntide, stop Hardly. sniffing the chlorine, man. Oh, I can't help it. Here, I can't. just wash your I face like... a little bit. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's better. Yeah, Far Cry 5, I think it's okay. Uh, give it a rent or uh, pick it up if it's dirt cheap. It's uh, It's some good dumb fun. Like, you can do, like, stunt events, and every time you start them... This bald eagle and like hard guitar solo start. <laughs> it's a, fun. It, it's stuff like that. I'm like, this is really fun. I have a pet grizzly bear that will eat people, and then oh. I get a phone call from his his owner. He's like, now Cheeseburger is a good old boy. He will love you. He's been raised by humans his whole life, so he loves people except peggies. We feed him peggies. <laughs> also, don't feed him cheeseburgers. He's got the diabetes. <laughs> Give him fish. Uh yeah, it's it's a good game. It's got a solid sense of humor sometimes, but overall there's a lot of moments where like the whole map of it is like it's kind of empty. But being able to have your own plane and fly around and That's shit cool. fucking bomb, you know, redneck cult yeah. members yeah. is funny. Yeah. And, and the glitches can be pretty funny sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that's I, I get you. So there's redeeming parts of the game. There's a re- it's still there's fun. redeeming parts of it, but it's still a lesser Far Cry three. Sure. So it's a lesser Far Cry 4, and I think and Far, Far Cry 4 is a lesser Far Cry 3. Yeah, so it's still on the downward slope. It's a downward slope Cry's. since 3, considering that 1 and 2 fucking suck. Mm, okay. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't played... Uh, the only one I played was 4. 1 and, and 2 fucking I have suck. To try four, 4 is like okay. I wasn't yeah. amazed by it. And then yeah. 5 is, is more okay. Yeah, gotcha. Even more okay than 4, I think. All right, well, there you go. So just if you're looking into Far Cry 5, just know that uh, going, going into that, that uh, sounds a little... It's a little meh. It's a little meh. Well, well, how about we break up the monotony of talking about a video game and once again talk about a movie that's an autobiography? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, so we, we both saw a movie. Uh, we saw them in separate locations. Yes. I, I went to the Logan because uh, I have a little gift card that I have from when I worked for them a couple oh, couple weeks over the yeah. summer. Just yeah, they all, loaded it up with some, some free shows on there for Yeah, just get like a couple that. free shows, maybe some popcorn, that, a drink or two. That makes it real nice and easy. Yeah, but uh, the duo of us got to see green book the green book 
uh, movie out, released toward the end of 2018. Yeah, around uh, Christmas time. Yeah, I uh, think it actually came out on Christmas Day. Yeah, I think so too. It's that Just kind of it's that got kind fucking of movie. blown out of the water by Spider Man and Aquaman. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's it's a very it's it's that kind of movie to come out around Christmas. I know it's nominated for you know some awards. It's, it's, one, it's won a couple Golden Globes for writing. It's, yeah, it's your typical feel good buddy comedy. About racism, yeah, and the buddy, uh, the the buddy duo here uh, is uh, Tony Lip, Tony uh, Vellalonga, Vellalonga, and, and, and then uh, Doctor Donald Shirley, who uh, Shirley is played by Mahershala Ali, and Tony Vellalonga is played by Viggo Mortensen, and um, and then his wife is played by Daphne, yes, Daphne, and she's also oh, no, in, not Daphne, Velma, v- Velma, yes, yeah. thank you, Velma. Uh, she's also in. Um, Bloodline on Netflix. She's the sister. Yeah. Um, I, she's kind of popped up in. I feel like she's popped up all over the place lately. I'm starting to see her more and more in like actual movies, so, yeah. which is dope. Because she I, think a she's good, a, I think she's a great actress. She does a very good job, too. And same in this as well. But as Greg mentioned, it's kind of a, a buddy duo thing where. It's a buddy comedy of like, oh, we're not so different, you and I, because it's set in 1962. Yeah, it's in, it's in 62, and Vigo Mortensen is this. Uh, Italian guy who grew up in the Bronx and has a he's a family man he's got a wife he's got two kids and his whole Italian family seemingly lives in his building or like they come over to his unit all the time and he's just you know that's that's his world he works at nightclubs he's a security guy kind of a Bronx uh, tough guy you know what I mean you know, he's like every stereotypical Bronx guy ever yeah but he's very he's like, hey, I'm gonna go down to uh, see Vinny and I'm gonna eat 27 hot dogs but and it, make $50 but he's also intensely likable that's the key is that he's there's a little soft racism to him at See, the beginning you, you say that i th- i think he's almost downright despicable sometimes why do you say that it's just because of like his kind of shittiness and just overall stupidity like he's he's a big dummy yeah like tony is is a big fucking dummy yeah he's not smart and no. that's, and you see that because he's juxtaposed against dr donald shirley who is this genius savant piano player who's going to touring around the country after playing at the white house twice he's like a genius yeah and he picks tony as his driver to chauffeur him all around the country as he tours including through the deep south where they both know will be problematic in the 1960s because dr donald shirley is black so he knows he's going to run into trouble yeah uh i just think i thought like from the beginning of the film and in in the middle when he's starting to warm up to doc he seemed uh, like comically like ignorant instead of being like actual like shitty uh beside like there there's a scene early in the movie and i thought that they were going to go like a more darker route of how he was going to be treating doc shirley yeah uh in the film where he's getting his window worked on when he came home and there are two black guys working on it. Mm-hmm. And immediate- one of his, one of his brothers refers to them as sacks of coal. I believe they, they call them eggplants, yeah, which yeah. is, is super racist. Yeah. There's a, again, it's the sixties. There was a lot of terminology in there that is obviously, well, yeah, pretty, no shit, pretty offensive. Like, yeah. I mean, the, the, the movie is called the green book because it's based off this actual, Traveler's Guide for, in the South, yeah, for blacks, yes, yeah. So because it showcases you places that are okay for black people to stay when in the South, they, yeah, you can't stay at the same motels as white people in the South at this time. So the Green Book is literally a black person travel guide for the yeah. South. Uh, but there are times where like his his ignorance is tried to play for laughs. Where I'm like, this should be taken just a, a tad bit more seriously. It, it, and it doesn't feel right. It feels cartoonish. It and I was, think, I it think was that, cartoonish. I will I, gi- I'll give you that. And I think that's because the writer of the film is Tony Lip's actual son. Yes, that's true. So you know that he's not going to be portrayed in a, in a super dark light. Exactly. But and my quest, my and that's why I was kind of like, this, this movie is trying to make this like person who is pretty much a dirtbag. Like, he's, a, he's a violent egotistical piece of shit but they they make him like funny dummy like See, a love like a lovable goof i i i do my impression of it was that he was a lovable goof i did not get like the i didn't get that he was really that dark because the thing is i know people like tony lip 
I know people in my life that are like that even to this day. They don't mean to be, but there's a soft racism to their whole existence. They see the world in a very narrow view, and that was Tony. And it wasn't necessarily his fault, and that's why Dr. Donald Shirley yeah, didn't I mean, hate of him course, either. Of course I'm not going to like, like, knock the movie down, because that's, of course, it's realism. And that's actually part of Tony and, and Doc's actual relationship in real life. Totally. It's just that the, the way that the story was presented, it was more like uh, Tony was more of a savior kind of character for Doc at, at a lot of moments. Yeah, you, the thing is, is that I, you could see they both impacted each other. And I, I think I know what you're saying in terms of that, like, Tony's impact on Shirley was played up certainly like yeah, he like, like he, I would say way more than Doc's uh, actual influence into Tony. Yeah, it was um, it was very subtle in terms of his influence on Tony. At the end, they they all you know they get back to New York City and it's Christmas Eve and Tony goes home and his whole family's around the table and he's invited Doc to come join him. Doc refuses, you know, declines at first and then and you know goes to his house above spoiler Carnegie Spoiler alert. Hall. Yeah, spoiler alert, right. But, well, I mean, it's not really a spoiler alert because it fucking happened. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But but anyway, though, um, there's a The moment. way that the entire family just lets him in when literally five minutes before they were like, hey, what was traveling around with that eggplant line? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was a I little was bit. like, what the fuck? Well, well, the thing was, though, is that Tony told the guy off. When the guy asked him pointedly at the table, how was it driving around with that? I don't remember the, the word that he used, but it was like, how was it driving around with that blank? And Tony says, don't call him that. And it's subtle, but if you were to picture that moment happening at a, happening at a real family table, I think like, that's the way that you tell a family member, Not like, in 1962. Hey, knock course, it off. And, and considering the way that his family's portrayed and like, all of his friends, they're just immediately going to be shitty, and it's just weird for him to walk into the room this is where, like, this was, obvi this was obviously vanilla up Mo for, movie. for a movie. Yeah, to make it more likable. For, I, for uh, Tony to become more likable. And there are times where I'm just like, all right, uh, th this is getting, like, so too you're, cartoonish. So your problem was it was the guys, Tony especially, was painted with, like, a forgiving brush. Yes, he was given more of a forgiving more tone. And I feel like if they set him up to be, like, way more real... I think that his eventual, like, hey, I actually like Doc would be more believable. Yeah. But, and, and then there's also the other thing, too, where uh, there's a moment where Doc Shirley is arrested because he's having, uh, he's, he's having relationships with a man at the YMCA. Right, right. And I'm just like, that's so, all right, all right, he's, he's gay. Mm -hmm. How does this add to the narrative at all? Like, the YMCA this, thing? Yeah, I'm like, I think this that is, was the only place he could go. I think I mean, that might have been where he was staying. Uh, I don't know. If, I don't know if that's where he was staying, but I thought that was like the only place maybe he could go. I don't think so because considering like it's constantly setting up in this city that like he's just getting like kicked out of everywhere left and right. It didn't matter if it was the YMCA. It's like okay, he's gay, and then it's never brought up ever again. I'm just like. Well, yeah, well, are you are you just are you just no, trying to it, throw like the gay thing in for to like was, stir the pot to it, be like okay he's even like more fucking oppressed because it's 1962. It was it was brought up a little bit later, like when Tony goes down a staircase and it, uh, Mahershala says to him like I'm sorry about last night, and Tony says don't worry, you know forget about it. I worked nightclubs in New York my whole life. It's a complicated world. That I thought was a very redeeming moment for Tony. He could have, he already was hating on him a little bit for being black. That was his thing. But he never judged him or said anything about a, a black gay guy in the 1960s. I thought that was a redeeming moment for Tony. I, thought, I, I don't know. Just the, mo the moviness of it, I'm like, uh, it, it's playing it too safe. It didn't, it didn't really do anything that was astounding. And then there would be times where they just gloss over things real fast. Like, like the gay thing. I'm like, oh, he's gay now. Cool. It, to me, I mean, it was a feel-good story. And throughout the movie, uh, it, I, did expe I kept expecting it to go darker. I, I, you know, I didn't know it was based on a real story until the end of it when they show you the two real guys in pictures and give you updates as to where they went to afterwards well, the in their lives The movie starts and stuff. with like a based on true story. Like that's, the, I think, that's I think, like I th the opening. I, th I think I might have missed that part. I think I was like out of the room or something. But um, the, the point is that like I did, that didn't really like hit me until like sort of the end. And so I kept expecting it to really like 
go somewhere darker. Like I, I mean, at all and parts, it never of the movie, does because really it's PG thirteen. Well, like it, right. it plays it super safe. Right, but I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed not, you know. I was expecting it to be dark and instead it stayed light and these two guys like a friendship formed and a lifelong friendship after that and it was just I liked it they I thought that they did have impact on each other and I mean obviously since it was written by the guy's kid yeah it's going to be like a little you know forgiving it's for a that little, dude. it's a little biased to to Tony yeah for and sure I felt, I felt like I I knew a lot about Tony but in terms of of Doc I felt like I didn't get a whole lot other than like it, the movie was was like the Odd Couple, but with racism thrown in. And Tony, to be fair, you're right about that. Tony was a lot more fleshed out in the movie as a character than Shirley was. Like exactly. no, no question exactly. about that. But again, the writer being his kid, he knew Tony. That was his. That was his he, lens. He knew them both through the story. Yeah, but that was uh, his, yeah. But then again, that that's well, why one I'm of like, them's his dad, and yeah, one of them's and his that's dad's why I'm friend. like, there's an obvious bias to being like, oh, Tony, Tony, there, ooh, yeah. But but this I thought fucking, this fucking cartoon man. But Vigo, uh, Vigo, and Mahershala Ali do excellent. They do, they do a very good job of acting. I, yes. I I thought, and again, I mean, like aside from what we were mentioning and stuff, I thought you know at the end of it, they both came out to be intensely likable. There are some good scenes where Mahershala does some like you know there's there's a, a great scene where you know Tony says something while they're driving and it's raining and Shirley makes him pull the car over and he walks out and he starts he has a he has a one moment where he you know does kind of voice like his real inside feelings and it's like you could you know kind of blew up but Mar- I thought Mahershala Ali handled that beautifully he's kind of at the top of top of the game right now I think anything that guy oh, he's an excellent in, actor actor and I'm so happy that he's doing so much more I'm glad that he's finally getting a lot of recognition outside of small bit roles absolutely yeah I think he's just very capable you yes. know he's this he's the lead in the upcoming season of true detective on HBO which I think has maybe has which already may started, bring me I back believe. because yeah yeah, well, yeah, season, yeah. Season two, like, who gives a shit? I think and, everybody and the end of season ship. one was kind of like, meh. Yeah, I think everybody jumped ship for season two, but Mahershala Ali's the lead. That makes me, like, very interested. But, like, there was just one thing I, I loved about it, uh, the Green Book, though, too, was to- uh, it does lend itself to the cartoonishness, but Tony's appetite through the movie. Yeah, His, like, the way that dude he eats, never stops fucking he, eating. He never stopped eating. And the way that he does, it's, it's, he, he says it. He says, he's like, my dad always told me, like, when you eat, eat like it's your very last meal. And that's how he eats every fucking meal. He, would eat, he eats like he hasn't eaten before, he, he but eats, you watched him. And then he eats cigarettes. Like, yeah. He, he always has a cigarette Constantly in his mouth. smoking or he's shoveling food into his mouth. Yeah. There's a point it's where like, those are his two redeeming qualities. He can eat an entire <laughs> bucket of KFC. There's a point... Uh, at, 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 when he's in a hotel and he oh, he's got this pizza on the bed next to him and he's writing a letter and he folds wife. the he entire folds pizza the and whole starts pizza eating it. up and shovels it into his mouth. That's why that's why moments like that I'm like okay this dude's a fucking cartoon, cartoon. character. It was cartoony but it's like it was funny that way like it made me it just made me laugh and it made me like the dude. It was just there was something about it. So I mean it's uh you know it's definitely you know Greg and I definitely took different things from it but that's that's what just know all of all of that going into before. Yeah. You see it, you know it's, it's it was it's based on a real story which was written by Tony Vallelonga's real son. That character who is a real person, his son wrote this movie. So as we were just saying, like it is clearly it's clearly through an adoring son's eyes it's, talking it's about going his dad. Through not not like the actual facts of it. It's like uh, of course there's actual facts to it, but like. The, tinted, uh, like getting, yeah, getting the tinted memories from his father, yeah. like his father telling the stories, right? And, and the letters were a nice touch because those were real, apparently. Oh, interesting. The letters were real, and that was, um, and and that was as we were alluding, the the two had impacts on each other. The letters that Tony's writing to his wife throughout the movie, they, they you they hear start him getting narrate, co-written by yeah, you hear him Doc. narrate them, and they start very shitty. You know, he's just describing what he's eating and the weather and all this, and then Doc loans him some of his you know words his genius to make it more poetic and romantic and you know then tony picks that up on his of his own accord later in the movie you know yeah. like they establish that that was an impact that doc did have on him but it's it is it's definitely not it's it's like any other it's not like real biopic world. it's it's yeah. been it's been glossed up it's been yeah. glamorized because it's you know hollywood yeah it's got to 
it's got to have an appeal to it. So and and that, and and Greg, I I have to say, like PG thirteen, and I will say like you are totally right in the sense that like there were moments in that movie when it felt like it was going to go dark. Like they were they were on the There's, edge of saying something actual poignant or yeah. something that was going to be actually deep. But then it's like every other movie about like, oh, here's here's one black guy and one white guy, and they're talking about the, their separate worlds. Oh, we're not so different, you and I, after all. And then there's there's a moment that, that I think of specifically where they get a flat tire and they pull over. It's the middle of the day in the South, and uh, Viggo Mortensen, he's changing the tire, and uh, Mahershala Ali gets out of the car, and he's just leaning against the car, but he looks into this field, and the field is full of... Black people picking, you know, like, like tend, tend, tending yeah. the fields, yeah. And he's there in his suit against a car being driven around by this white guy in the south. And so these people in the field put, you know, slowly put their like like lean on their tools and kind of stop working and stare over at Doctor Shirley, and he stares back at them. And there was no dialogue, like, but there was that moment felt to me like, wow, this I don't know where this is going to go. And, and then I, it doesn't go anywhere. It they did, just it fucking didn't go anywhere. drive away. But I'll tell you something. That to me was it was it was okay. The point I thought was made. He was different than they were at that time. He was an yeah, oddity. They, they constantly beat that in, into your head. Like he's not accepted by white people. He's also not accepted by black people. He's an outcast. Well, well, but that to they don't beat you over the head with it the way that like Spike Lee did in Black Klansman. You think about his, the way Spike Lee made his point. He comes in with a hammer at the end and hits you with it. This is really still happening here in America and Charlottesville and all that shit. He leaves no doubt about what he's saying. This movie was more subtle. Green Book came at you with a little knife. Subtle? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. This movie was not subtle about, I, about any of the racism, man. It was more this subtle was, this than... Was, it was more subtle than Spike Lee in Black Klansman, that's for sure. They're pretty much the same. It's just that Green Book is very obviously more of like, it, it's more for a general audience. Yeah. It's or a, Black it's a family Klansman, movie. Black yeah. Klansman was very much going for like, we have a message. This is the message. Which is, which is Spike Lee's style. Yeah. That, that's what he does. He, and, and, that's, and that's okay. But for whatever reason, when I was watching Green Book, Black Klansman kept coming up in my head. And when I compared the two... It, that, that was more the impression I got for it. But you're, you're very right in that Spike Lee makes his point known, and Green Book was made trying to appeal to a wide audience. Yeah. It's a family movie. It's PG-13, did you say, right? Yeah, it's PG-13. I think the movie plays it way too safe. I, mm. think, it's, I think it's pretty meh. Like, it's schmaltzy to the point of like being like, oh, come on. Fair like, enough. Like being shoved too many like chocolates into your mouth. You're like, Stop. <laughs> that's stop. Enough. That's enough. I don't want to see this fucking goofy Italian like stereotype say another goofy Bronx thing. That's, I yeah. don't want to fucking hear another soliloquy from him. I don't <laughs> care. That's, stop and that's, it. And that's fine. That's fine. This I, Bugs Bunny fucker. Right, Jesus Christ. Shoveling a whole pizza into his mouth and yeah. then smoking 20 cigarettes and all that. I, I get that. And that's fair. I, I liked it. It was a little, you know, it was sweet that way. It's, it's schmaltzy. Every, it's, everything Greg says is totally valid. I just, it, it rubbed me where the right way, I guess. Like, it's a Christmas style movie. It's holidays. Watch it with the family. It's, it is safe. It doesn't go those dark places that it feels like it's going to go. And um, it's something you take. You, it's something you take your mom and dad to, and they're like, "Wow, <laughs> yeah that that is absolutely the way it's going to be." Yeah, you can watch it with your mom and dad. Watch it with your kids. It's it's that kind of movie. It's yeah. Remember, it, remember the Titans style of it's, it's the odd it's, couple. It yeah. is the odd couple road trip. Yeah, yeah, with yeah. racism. Yeah, but if you like, you know, if if you like Mahershala Ali, if you like, you know, Vigo as as a cartoony Bronx guy eating every meal like it's his last meal, and uh, and some some soft touches at the at the racial, the real ugly racial history of America, then uh, the Green Book, then that's then that's what you uh, you can go see. Wow, look at these three things. Yeah. Two biopics and a fucking and a, and a over game. the top over the top fucking redneck game. Yeah. So yeah, definitely everything like it, I think it was a thematic almost. Every all the content we just brought up for you, it all it's all has a grain of salt. They all have their things about them that are like, oh, it's not great. But there are parts of them that are redeeming. There are parts of them that are enjoyable. So, as we mentioned, Vice, Christian Bale as Dick Cheney, uh, Far Cry 5, a downward slope from 3, um, and Green, Green Book. Book. 
it's safe, but it's not it's not a terrible movie. Right. It's just it's I think it's middle of the road. Yeah. So Greg yeah, Greg it's it's it's, it's sweet. Sweet and at times cartoon. It's heartwarming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's that's those are our feelings on those things. Check them out. It's uh, as we mentioned, it's cold, it's gross. Definitely a good time to watch a movie or play a game. That's if you're in the Midwest. No. This is the time to do it. Well, I gotta tell you, I'm still feeling pretty hungry. So how about we give another nice little phone a Rooney to room service? Yeah, do that. Uh, my, I'm starting to wrinkle up here too. Maybe we can get some towels. What do you think? Yeah, I think we could get a couple warm towels. Yeah. All right, we're gonna we're yeah. gonna see uh, what the deal is with this hotel staff here. And, yeah. Uh, have a few more splash, 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 splashes. Don't splash my equipment. Oh. Don't. Oh my God. Fire! 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 What you just heard was a fantasy, a fiction cooked up for your amusement and the catharsis of the hosts. Please have mercy on them.